Hello everyone, welcome back to Go Big Bore or Go Home. I'm your host Sean, and we're back with another First Friday Fives here in September of 2020. When it comes to shooting big bore handguns, the most common type of handgun you will find is a revolver. And since we are no longer in the 19th century, many of us prefer the ergonomics and convenience of a good double action revolver to the more traditional single action. And when you start treading into the territory of 44 Magnum and up in terms of power, some revolvers have really made a name for themselves. Now I wanted to list entrants from a manufacturer only once so one company didn't dominate the list. Otherwise I feel like this would only be about Ruger and Smith & Wesson. So having said that, let's take a look at the top 5 big bore double action revolvers. Before we begin, I want to give an honorable mention to one revolver in particular, and that is the Smith & Wesson Model 29. I didn't include it in the list mainly because it would clearly take the number one spot. It has the benefit of being the star of the Dirty Harry films, sorry Clint, and is much more exposed than the others. It also was the first revolver to market that was chambered in the 44 Magnum, making it the first real big bore powerhouse since the introduction of the 45 Colt. It just didn't feel fair to have the others compete with it. The Smith & Wesson Model 29 is the father of double action big bore revolvers. It set the standard that all future big bore double action revolvers had to meet or beat. The Model 29 was released in January 1956 and was built on Smith & Wesson's end frame. The first 15 years were a little rough as many shooters weren't prepared for the power and recoil of the 44 Magnum. There were people who had hammer spur marks in their forehead from the gun recoiling into their face. In fact, if it wasn't for the aforementioned film, Dirty Harry in 1971, the gun and the caliber may not have survived. But the movie made the Model 29 such a star that Smith & Wesson could not keep up with demand. Gun shops were selling them for over retail price at the time, and when you look at the gun, it's easy to see why. The Model 29 is a tough gun built to shoot the, at the time, world's most powerful production handgun cartridge. It's also a pretty damn good looking revolver. The 29 could be had in nickel or in the now iconic blued finish. It is accurate, and when treated with proper maintenance, will stand up to decades of wear and tear. I've heard many big bore revolver lovers like Max Prasik, Jack Huntington, and David Bradshaw sing the gun's praises, and if you decide to pick one up, you won't be disappointed. Number 5. The Dan Wesson Model 40. I really wish I could put this revolver higher up on the list, but I think this is the right place for it. First appearing in 1983, the Model 40 was Dan Wesson's double action revolver designed for silhouette competition. It had a stretched frame so it could chamber the new 357 Super Mag. For all intents and purposes, this was the 357 Maximum with a slightly longer case of 1.610 inches versus the Maximum's 1.605 inches. I know that's not a big bore, but keep your shirt on, we'll get there. The Model 40 was built with some suggestions from the late Elgin Gates, who had dreamed up the Super Magnums in the 70s. In 1984, they started moving up caliber to the 375 Super Mag. But it was in 1988 that Dan Wesson announced the chambering of the 445 Super Mag and they were shipping by 1989. This is the chambering that had been wildcatted in one form or another since 1983 when the Model 40 hit the market. Reading John Taffin's work, you'll find a number of different wildcats that are essentially the 445 Super Mag. The final chambering was the 414 Super Mag that was released in 1994. The Model 40 brought with it a unique feature in double action revolvers. It made a splash by always offering the shooter multiple barrel length options. Using a barrel shroud that locked with a nut at the muzzle, owners could swap barrels fairly easily. How cool is that? Your options were 2 inches, 4 inches, 6 inches, 8 inches, or 10 inches for your barrel. This meant you could have a 10 inch silhouette gun and a 4 inch trail gun all at once. That's pretty awesome. But the Model 40 had its drawbacks too. The Model 40 was purpose-built for silhouette, and the stretch frame made the gun oversized for the average shooter. When compared with a modern Smith & Wesson X-Frame, it's almost the same size, and the chamberings were not common and made finding ammo for a non-reloader really difficult. But the elephant in the room was quality control. While some of the Model 40s were absolutely fantastic, Dan Wesson didn't have proper machining equipment in the 80s, which made mass-produced consistency and precision difficult to achieve. One source I spoke with said quality was very hit and miss at the time, and when they missed, it could mean an unsalvageable revolver. After the Model 40 production ceased and Dan Wesson was sold to another owner, they acquired proper machining equipment and improved their consistency substantially, and they even produced some stretch frames as late as the mid-2000s, including my own Model 7445 and 445 Super Mag. The Model 40 was, and still is, an amazing revolver, and blazed the trail of stretch frame double action revolvers when the 500 Smith & Wesson Magnum wasn't even a twinkle in Smith & Wesson's eye. But inconsistent quality and rare chamberings keep it right here at number 5. 
Number 4. The Taurus Raging Bull I have to hand it to Taurus. This revolver was designed around how to sell it to a customer, and they nailed it. Released in 1998, the Raging Bull was built to make a beast of a cartridge more manageable. That beast was the 454 Casul. The Raging Bull was designed to be stout and tough with three locks on the cylinder utilizing two latches, and to ease the suffering of the shooter, they ported the barrel on either side of the front sight to reduce felt recoil, added a full underlug for additional weight, and a grip that has specific cushioning in the back to reduce impact on the palm. Now the 454 Casul was shootable for a lot more of the curious handgunners out there. The Raging Bull features a 5-shot cylinder and comes in multiple barrel lengths from 2.25 inches for carry-friendly trail defense to an 8.37 inches for those who want to maximize velocity and accuracy. And the Raging Bull has been offered in several other big bore calibers. While now discontinued, the Raging Bull can be found on the used market in 41 Magnum, which is a 6-shot, 480 Ruger, and the King of the Hill, the 500 Smith & Wesson Magnum. Although I have heard the 500 Magnum Raging Bulls were discontinued due to strength issues, so approach these with caution. Still offered in a 6-shot is the old reliable 44 Magnum. They have even had offshoots of the Raging Bull in the form of the Raging Hunter, available in 357 Magnum, 44 Magnum, and 454 Casul, and the crossover Raging Judge, which adds the 454 Casul to the standard Judge's 45 Colt and 410 bore chamberings. But for all the versatility and variety, the Raging Bull does have to contend with the public perception of Taurus. Their quality over the years is something that has been debated heatedly, and many consider them to be subpar. Truth be told, they aren't bad revolvers, but they won't be the same level as a Smith & Wesson or a Ruger. But they don't hit your wallet as hard either, so it's up to the individual as to whether or not that's a problem. The Raging Bull is a great revolver that boldly chambered the 454 Casul in double action before anyone else. And with multiple chamberings and options for the buyer, it is worth the time to check one out. Number 3. The Colt Anaconda a true icon of big bore revolvers, the Colt Anaconda was the king of Colt's snake gun lineup I hate snake shock! I hate em! that included the Cobra, King Cobra, and now re-released Python. It was also the first and only double action revolver to enter the big bore magnum category. Released in 1990, the Anaconda was chambered in 44 magnum and later in 45 Colt as well, although the 45 Colt Anacondas are very rare. It came with a 4-inch, 6-inch, or 8-inch full underlug ventilated rib barrel that was very reminiscent of the Python, a cosmetic appeal not lost on the public who were looking to buy one. While Colt did have some accuracy issues at first, they were quick to deal with these and correct them. Once the bugs were worked out, the Anaconda was widely hailed as having exceptional accuracy and one of the best triggers on the market. With a good amount of weight and stout construction, the revolver was known for being able to digest some heavy loadings and making recoil more tameable. The gun was also revered for its aesthetic qualities, as it was and still is quite stunning, at least in my opinion. While main production ceased in 1999, the custom shop offered made-to-order anacondas all the way up until 2003. If you want to buy one now, expect to shell out a hefty sum as these snakes are of high value on the used market. There are really only two downsides with the anaconda. The first is that they were discontinued, making them rare and expensive. And the second is that the inner mechanics are actually quite intricate when it comes to repairs. If your Anaconda needs an adjustment or repair, you absolutely want to find a gunsmith who has been specifically trained on how to tune cold actions, as they are far more difficult to tune than they appear. That said, if you have the money to buy one of these gems, I doubt the cost of an expert smith is beyond your means. With the reintroduction of the Colt Python, there are rumors that the Anaconda will one day return to production. Time will tell, but if you can get your hands on a used one, you will have one special revolver. Number 2. The Smith & Wesson Model 500 and 460 XVR I put these two together because they are essentially the same gun, just with a different chambering. Built on Smith & Wesson's X-Frame, the 500 debuted in 2003 with the new most powerful production handgun round in the world, the 500 Smith & Wesson Magnum. Two years later, in 2005, the 460 XVR debuted with another new round, the powerful and extreme velocity round, the 460 Smith & Wesson Magnum. There are a lot of debates about which round is in fact more powerful, but I will simply say that whichever way you lean on the debate, you've got strong arguments to make your case. Both are right around the same muzzle energy when loaded to the top of their parameters. The X-Frame is a well-designed behemoth version of Smith & Wesson's N-Frame, capable of digesting truly punishing cartridges. Both rounds top out over 60,000 PSI in chamber pressure, so the X-Frame had to be stout. 
These revolvers feature five-shot cylinders and most have a massive muzzle brake to tame the intense recoil that these revolvers generate. Add to that the massive weight from the abundance of stainless steel involved and these monsters can be quite livable, and they aren't short on options. They can be had with barrels as short as 3.5 inches, sans muzzle brake, to 10 inches for both chamberings, and 14 inches for the 460 Smith & Wesson Magnum. And the Performance Center has several models that really take these guns to a new level. I personally have a 460 XVR 7.5 model from the Smith & Wesson Performance Center that my wife gifted me, and it is an exceptional shooter. These chamberings also provide excellent versatility as well. Like most Magnums, the X-Frames can shoot shorter cartridges. The 460 XVR is well known for being able to digest the 454 Casul and the 45 Colt. The 500 will also chamber the 500 Special, and I have heard that it can also shoot the 500 JRH as well but check with the manufacturer on the JRH as I am not 100% certain on that. The downside to these massive Magnum Maulers is their size. They are super heavy, which can really wear you out when shooting for an extended period, or if you're carrying them afield. Not to mention that their size makes them as practical to carry as a sledgehammer. Powerful, yes, but as maneuverable as a Mack truck. Still, this revolver made the list for a good reason. It chambers two of the most powerful handgun cartridges in the world that can be loaded to take anything that walks this planet, and that has not been lost on the hunting crowd. But maybe there is a better choice for the top of the list. Number one. Drum roll, please. The Ruger Super Red Hawk. When it comes to great double action big bore revolvers that can deliver the goods, I don't think it gets better than the Ruger Super Red Hawk. The Super Red Hawk was introduced in 1987 in 44 Magnum. The idea was to address some of the Red Hawk's flaws. The Red Hawk's trigger and hammer were operated by one spring, which made tuning the trigger a delicate process. Do it wrong, and you may end up with light strikes, which could prove deadly in the field. The Super Red Hawk uses separate springs, allowing for proper tuning with much less risk. Another issue on the two-fix list was mounting a scope. The Red Hawk Hunter could mount a scope on the barrel, but this wasn't the most suitable location. The beefier extended frame of the Super Red Hawk made room for a forward scope ring, allowing the frame to be the mounting point. And if you've ever owned one, Ruger even provides scope rings with the gun. Lastly, the Red Hawk's grip frame was changed to mimic the GP100s for better grip options. The Super Red Hawk now employs the Hogue Tamer grip, which has a sorbethane insert where the web of the palm meets the grip, right where it matters most. Ruger also expanded the range of calibers in the Super Red Hawk. In 1999, just one year after the Taurus Raging Bull hit the market, Ruger released the first 454 Casul Super Red Hawk. To strengthen the revolver for this and the next cartridge that followed, the barrel and the cylinder are made from the incredibly strong 465 Carpenter steel. This allowed Ruger to employ a six-shot cylinder, and in 2003, Ruger released a Super Red Hawk in the first cartridge to bear the Ruger name, the 480 Ruger, also with a six-shot cylinder. While it was discontinued in 2010, the cartridge has become popular with handgun hunters and was reintroduced in 2013. To make the gun better for trail defense, Ruger released the Super Red Hawk Alaskan with a 2.5-inch barrel chambered in 454 Casul and 480 Ruger in 2005, with the 44 Magnum version following in 2007. There have been some special runs in 41 Magnum and 10mm Auto as well through the distributor Lipsys, so you can even go down in big bore power if you want. So why does the Ruger Super Red Hawk get the number one spot? Well, its quality is more consistent than the Dan Wesson Model 40 and it has a shorter frame, it's stronger than the Taurus Raging Bull and holds one more round, it's cheaper than an Anaconda with more caliber offerings and is still in production, it's lighter, more packable, and less recoil laden than the Smith & Wesson 500 and 460 XVR. And even our honorable mention doesn't have the caliber versatility or optic-ready construction of the Super Red Hawk. Like any revolver, it's not perfect. It is bulky, less smooth than a Smith & Wesson, and to my eyes has all the beauty of an Abrams tank. But you'd be hard-pressed to find a better-built, more versatile, big-bore, double-action revolver for your money. So let's recap that list before we go, shall we? Number 5, the Dan Wesson Model 40 the revolver that made Elgin Gates Super Magnums a reality. Number four, the Taurus Raging Bull, making the 454 Casul more shooter friendly. Number three, the Colt Anaconda. Snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? The sexiest and smoothest double action big bore ever. Number two, the Smith & Wesson 500 and 460 XVR. 
the king of double action revolver power. And number one, the Ruger Super Red Hawk. Built tough, built versatile, and ready for whatever you can throw at it. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed the list. Do you agree with our list or would you have changed the order around or maybe changed which double action revolvers to include? Let us know in the comments section below. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe for more Big Boar content. If you didn't enjoy the video, thank you for giving us a chance. It's really appreciated. And remember, go Big Boar. Very dangerous. You go first. Or go home.